Well, the Lord gave me a message to share with you today that I found interesting. I've, it, it really ties into the name of this ministry. And you know, the naming of this church came at a very interesting time. It came immediately following an event that the enemy meant to be a crushing defeat, <laughs> but we weren't gonna have that. And church, I gotta tell you, God is good. He instantly had me looking forward and not looking back. And I believe that the name, by the time just a few days passed, we already had our attorney incorporating us. The name was already established. And I know God gave me that name, Faith and Victory Fellowship. Because as long as I've been preaching, I've been encouraging you to believe for victory. And, and as long as I've been preaching, I've been preaching faith, because it's the only way you're gonna get it. Without faith, we can't please God. And by faith, we obtain the promises of God. So this is what, this is what we need. This is God's way of accomplishing things, amen? And I believe that the message contained in that name is so clear, it's easy for us to run with. Now in our weekly Bible study, well, this week we began Ruth because we recently concluded Judges. And I, I found Judges so incredibly interesting. If you're not familiar with what Judges is all about, it was a period in the history of Israel. First, we had a period where there were these strong leaders. There was Moses, there was Joshua. But after they died, passed away, God established a period of judges. There were judges that were placed in authority. And, and they were the central power in, in the nation of Israel. And every time one of these judges died, <laughs> the people instantly went bad. You know, it's funny, just on the way here, I noticed all these lawns, you know those tall things with the white ball on top? When you were a kid, you used to go, Pff, yeah. I, what are they? Is that what they are? Those are dandelions after they go bad? Okay. They're everywhere. I mean, they, I passed some houses that look like a sea of those things. And I said to my wife, isn't it interesting that the Earth's default setting is weeds? If you don't work that land to overcome the weeds, the weeds will overcome the land. This all goes back to the fall of man. It wasn't supposed to be this way, but the land is cursed. And unless the blessed person puts their hand to that cursed land, it's going to stay cursed. Church, so it is with many people. Every time a judge in Israel passed away, the people's default setting was sin. If they didn't have someone over them, almost lording over them, they instantly ran out and started serving other gods. This is one of the reasons why when you study the book for a, a full understanding, you, you'll see why. How many people say, oh, God was so violent in the Old Testament. Yeah, you know why? Because he was trying to eradicate sin from mankind. So if there was a sinful nation, he wanted them gone so that his chosen people could prosper without the threat of sin. I'm getting into a whole bunch of stuff. I wanted to share with you about judges. Every time the people lost their judge, the people went bad. But it's interesting that every time they went bad, they, they went, wound up under the oppression 
of another pagan nation. And every time they wound up under that oppression, it shows in Judges, every time they cried out to the Lord, and the Lord would send them another judge to, to deliver them out of the captivity and to lead them into a life of, of peace and prosperity. Oh, God is good. Church, God has always been good. His heart has always been for his children. Now, in chapter 6 of Judges, and verse 1, it says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. It says that many, many times in Judges. And then it says, And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. Now, I want you to understand this. There was no real understanding amongst the, the people in that day of Satan. Do you ever see Satan talked about in the Old Testament? No. But he was around from the beginning of time, wasn't he? People didn't have an understanding of him, though. They didn't understand that whole principle of evil, of principalities, of powers, of the rulers of darkness of this world. They didn't understand it. So everything was attributed to God. Everything good was attributed to God. And everything catastrophic was attributed to God. So uh, they were always blaming God for the good, the bad, and the ugly. When God had nothing to do with the bad and the ugly. Church, what it really boiled down to is that Israel repeatedly broke covenant with God. It was just that simple. They sinned, they backslid, and, and in most cases, it involved them serving and worshiping other gods. Therefore, what they really did is they made a choice. Hmm? Like, let's make a deal. You choose door one or door two. They made a choice and repeatedly made the wrong choice. And, and, and in, in so doing, what they kept doing is stepping out from under Yahweh's covering. Amen? Out from under God's protection. Out from under Jehovah's providence or provision. And, and out from under his blessing. Well, if you step out from under, I, I only started noticing this in, in recent years, how when it's really sunny and hot, people will walk around with an umbrella. First time I saw that, I was thinking, what's that person crazy? It's not raining. But it puts shade over you. Now, if you didn't have that umbrella, what's going to happen to you? You're going to get sunburned. It's no different with the covering that God provides for his people. As long as you remain under that covering, uh, covering in fellowship, in covenant with God, then you, you're in a place where you will enjoy the protections and the provisions that come with that relationship. However, if you step out from under that covering, you're on your own. God didn't throw you out, you stepped out. And when you got out there, you found out it's hot out here and I'm going to get sunburned. But God didn't make it happen. It was a fruit of wrong choice. Are you all with me? Everybody happy? <laughs> now, in chapter 6 of Judges, we see that the promised land was invaded and occupied by vast numbers of Midianites. And along with them, Amalekites, it says in the, the children of the east, you know who they were? The children of the east were Ishmaelites, today known as Arabs. Amen? We're still dealing with them. They're called ISIS. Now, along with these vast numbers of Midianites, Amalekites, and Ishmaelites, came vast numbers of camels and donkeys and whatever livestock they brought with them, which then created vast piles of poop. <laughs> and they ate up vast pastures 
to the point where there was nothing worthwhile left for the Israelites. In Judges 6 and verse 2, it says, And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens, which are in the mountains, in caves and strongholds. The people that God gave the land to, his children, were now living in caves, hiding out on their own land. And so it was, it says in verse 3, when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them and they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth. You understand what that means? They ate everything. Anything that would grow, either the people ate it or the, the donkeys ate it or the camels ate it, something ate it. It says they left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. Verse 5, for they came up with their cattle and their tents. They came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number. There were so many of them you couldn't count them. And they entered into the land to destroy it. Verse 6, and Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Here it is. This all happened because of them stepping out of covenant with God. And when they did, they came under the oppression of the Midianites. This lasted for just so long. And finally, one bright light said, hey, I think we should cry out to the Lord. My father told me it works, and my grandfather told me it works. They cried out to the Lord. Verse 7, And it came to pass, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, verse 8, that the Lord sent a prophet. Now this is the first time that the Lord didn't just instantly send a judge. First he sent his word. This is how the word was communicated in those days. He couldn't send a CD. He couldn't send a Bible. Huh? He sent a prophet. He sent a man or a woman of God. It doesn't say who it was. And believe me, I searched, trying to find out who this could have been. It doesn't say. But it was a person living a submitted life that God could speak to, and they would faithfully and diligently carry the word to wherever God destined it to be delivered. The Lord sent a prophet, in verse 8, unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, and brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and drave them out from before you, and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God, fear not, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. In other words, you are serving the gods of the Amorites and you've stepped out of covenant with me. Church, Israel at this point desperately needed a deliverer. They they were in dire straits. They were living in caves. They were hungry. They were hidden from the armies of aliens that had taken over their homeland. (laughs) Have you ever felt, have you ever had something coming against you that feels like more than you can handle? I know I have, huh? I mean, you know, if you got a single little thing, it's not really a big deal. You'll handle it. But man, when it just keeps coming and there's stuff thrown on top of stuff on top of stuff, and you look and you, like, imagine, they looked out and this army that assembled against them was so vast, it said they couldn't count them. Imagine what that felt like. Ah, this is going to get better. This is the appetizer. God's got something good for you, church. God then issued an undeniable calling upon a young man named Gideon. 
I've shared about Gideon before, but not this way. The Lord has shown me some new things about Gideon. Gideon had his doubts, his fears, his questions, just like every person with flesh. In Judges 6 and verse 13, it says, And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us. What? He was just delivered a word from a prophet of God that said, I delivered you from Egypt. I delivered you from the Amorites. I have set you free. And now he says, well, if the Lord is. But listen to what he says. If the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Do you see the wrong thinking here? Do you see how all the wrong in the world was being attributed to God when God was trying so desperately to do right for them? He sent a prophet, and all they had in response was doubt, doubt, doubt. Oh, church, we've got to get this, okay? Because every one of us goes through stuff. And, And if you want victory, you need faith. Amen? Faith is a victory producing substance, faith is a substance. It's, it's tangible. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. That means things that you were, were confidently expecting when you have faith in God is going to produce them. They have substance. Oh, praise God. So here, Gideon gets a word from a prophet And his response is nothing but actually insulting. If the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? Because you're going out on your belly and praying to the the God of the Amorites. That's why. Baal. And where be all his miracles? They're under the umbrella. You're standing outside. Church, this is really simple. But we can make it so complicated. He says, but now the Lord hath forsaken us. No, he hasn't. You have forsaken him. Aha. And delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. No, he didn't. God didn't deliver you into their hands. You did. You stepped out from under that protective covering of God. Church, he's got a hedge about you. But you know what the word says about that hedge? It says that the person on the inside kicked a hole in the hedge. Do you know that? I'd have to look it up for you. And got snake bit. If only they had stayed inside the hedge that God put around them. But instead we got to go kicking holes in it. If we would stop the nonsense, the fearing, the questioning, the challenging, life would be a whole lot easier for us. So if we want the victory, we got to have the faith. Amen? Verse 14, and the Lord looked upon him and said, go go in this thy might that thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? In spite of his questioning, his fears, his doubts, God was telling him, listen, I chose you, so go now. Go and do what I told you to do. He said to him, you're going to save Israel. So you can imagine Gideon doing his best Ralph Crandon. Hamada, 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 hamada. He then said, in verse 15, he said unto him, Oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? How am I going to do that? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. You picked on the wrong guy. I'm the skinny, scrawny one of the family. I can't save Israel. And the Lord said unto him in verse 16, Surely I will be with thee, 
and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Don't look at the numbers. He said, you, it doesn't matter how big that army is. This is all unspoken. God's bigger. Amen. If God be for us, who could be against us? So it doesn't matter if there's 100 or 1,000 or 135,000. It doesn't matter. As long as God is on your side, you ain't losing. Amen. God says, just go. I'll be with you. That was his answer. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, My own hand hath saved me. So what God was saying is that if you go with the number you've got, you're going to take credit for the victory. You're going to say, Ain't we bad? That's, that's what God said. Is that's, that's what you're going to do. Yeah, you're going to come back saying, yeah, 135,000 of them, 32,000 of us, we whooped them good. God had to make it so impossible that any sensible person would realize this had to be God. So against these innumerable, uncountable people, God decides we got to lessen the numbers a little bit. God would make the odds against Israel so great that everyone would know it had to be God that fought with Israel. In following verses, which I'm not going to go through for the sake of time, God passed down Gideon's 32,000 to 300. 300 men. And then he instructed them to take some very unusual weapons of warfare. Judges 7, beginning in verse 16. You all still with me? I'm not losing you. And he, Gideon, divided the 300 men into three companies. Three groups of 100. And he put a trumpet in every man's hand. Now, you know, a trumpet in those days wasn't a brass three-valved instrument. It was a ram's horn. It was a shofar. You know, the same instrument that brought down the walls of Jericho? <laughs> he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall you do. Verse 18, When I blow the trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp, and say, So now their mouth became involved. And say, after you sound the trumpet, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. 300 men are going to do this. Against 135,000 plus. So Gideon and the hundred that were with him in verse 19 came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle of the watch, or of the middle watch, um, and they had but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets, break the pitchers, and held their lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow withal. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Verse 21, and they stood every man in his place. After they did this, after they obeyed what God told them to do, as unusual as it might seem, they realized, I guess, that this was God, and they stood. They took their place, and they weren't going to be moved. Verse 22. 
Verse 22, it says, And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. Do you see what happened? They blew the trumpets. They shouted. They, they broke the pitcher. They took out their lamp. And panic set in to the camp of 135,000 men that they all jumped up, drew their swords, and started battling one another. Absolute confusion. It says that they set every man's sword against his fellow. They killed one another. And they, it says that even throughout all the host, all of them, church, the more I pondered and meditated on this account, the more was revealed to me. Then I attended a pastor's meeting the other day with a group of men that, that I fellowship with. And a discussion began in this meeting, and what do you think it had to do with? It had to do with the trumpet, with the pitcher, and with the torch. And I was like, I got these notes on my desk. Church, we need to take up arms as Gideon did. And, and, and when we do, we will win against all odds as Gideon did. Friends, the first piece of armament that God told them to take up was the trumpet. They were to blow the trumpet and say the sword of the Lord. Friends, this trumpet is nothing other than the word or the voice of the Lord himself. Are you hearing me? That's what they heard. They heard the voice of the Lord being trumpeted, 300 of them at one time. And then they heard the, the men that were blowing and sounding that alarm. They heard them shouting about the sword of the Lord. The next piece of Gideon's armament was the pitcher, which is the vessel. Church, we are the vessels. You're the pitchers. But something interesting had to happen. That vessel, that pitcher, had to be broken. There was a light inside of it. But it wasn't clear glass like we have today. It was opaque. So there was a smoldering. In those days, they didn't carry whole big lit torches around. I forget there was a term for it. But it would smolder, and they would put it in something. And when they got where they were going, they would pull it out. And when the oxygen got to it, it would flame. It was on fire all along. That's where the saying comes from, where there's smoke, there's fire. But it was only when it was out of the pitcher and in the oxygen that the flame would explode, basically. We're this vessel. We're the pitchers. And we have to be broken before we can really serve our purpose. All, hear this, all association with the person that we once were has got to be broken. Huh? All identifying with the old life and the old man, the old woman, the old ways, the old thoughts, the old lusts, the old urges, it's got to go. It's got to be broken. Church, the purpose of breaking that vessel is to release the light and the fire that was within. That's the power of the Holy Ghost, church. That torch would serve no purpose if it remained contained. 